We've seen a video of a treadmill incident on Dana Carter, March 20th of 2021. Have you seen that video? No. Why not? Because I don't want to see Corey mistreated. The defendant's father took the stand on Wednesday as the defense's first witness. Now, we're bringing you the latest out of Ocean County, New Jersey, in the trial of Christopher Gregor. He faces life imprisonment on child endangerment charges and murder charges surrounding the six-year-old death of his son, Corey Micholo. Now, the child endangerment charge comes from a March 2021 incident after surveillance footage captured Gregor forcing his son to run on a treadmill at increasing speeds, despite the boy repeatedly falling. The following month, Gregor rushed Micholo to the hospital after he woke up from a nap and started stumbling, slurring his speech and vomiting. After roughly an hour at the hospital, Micholo was pronounced dead following a seizure while undergoing a CAT scan. Now, prosecutors believe Gregor's repeated abuse led to the six-year-old's death, while his defense team believes sepsis was the real killer. So we'll have to see how this case, case plays out as it, it continues. Court has been in recess for almost an entire week due to scheduling conflicts, and the state's case is still underway. However, when they were back in session Wednesday for a defense witness called out of order, uh, we just heard the father. Now, I do want to disclose to you that my husband, Dr. Michael Bodden, a forensic pathologist, has been retained by the defense and will be testifying in this case. With that disclosure, as you heard just moments ago, that witness David Greger, the defendant's father, took the stand last week without the jury present to determine if he'd be allowed to even testify. Fast forward to Wednesday morning, where important topics were brought out with David Greger with the jury present. So let's start with testimony about Greger's initial reaction to his son's death. On April 2nd, did you hear from Christopher? I did. And about what time did you hear from Christopher? It was sometime after 5. Okay. And where were you at the time? In the car. Okay. And where were you going? Um, my wife had called me. I went home to pick her up. And uh, we were heading down to Barnegat. Okay. And can you please describe the conversation you had with Christopher, that first conversation? The first conversation is when I took the phone from my wife. Um, Christopher was on the phone with her. I could hear it was loud uh, and very excitable. And I asked her to give me the phone, and then I got the phone. Okay. What was Christopher's demeanor during that conversation? Hysterical. Um, when's the next time you heard from Christopher? A few months later. Okay. And describe that conversation. It was the same. It was, he was inconsolable. He just lost his son. Now, calling your attention to April 2nd, you spoke to your son while you were driving down to the hospital in Stafford, correct? Correct. And... When you spoke to your son while you were driving to the hospital, you told your son that you were going to contact the police, correct? I did. And that was based upon conversations that you had with your son on that day, correct? It was. And when you got to the hospital, after you had told your son that you were going to contact the police, your son wasn't there at the hospital, correct? He wasn't in the emergency room, no. And when you got to the hospital, Corey was there by himself without any family member, correct? That's correct. They wouldn't let my wife and I in. Right. And your son, though, he was not with Corey when you got to, to the hospital, right? No. And in the time between from when your son left until you got there, Corey was alone in the hospital without any family members, correct? As far as I know. And finally, on April 3rd, your son calls you, correct? Correct. And when he called you, he was in Arkansas, correct? That's what I believe, uh, and I believe it from looking at the phone log. I don't remember him telling me he was in Arkansas. 
But it's your understanding, based upon what you reviewed, that he was in Arkansas, correct? That's what I believe. Oh. And then you're the person who told your son to come back, correct? We all did. And you told him that he needed to get home from Arkansas, correct? So, as you know, the prosecution also asked David Greger about observing bruises on Machola's body prior to his death. So I'm going to take you to um, March 22nd, I believe, is the date that you testified about. And on that day, you and your wife went down to Barnegat, correct? We did. And you saw your son that day, correct? Correct. And you saw Corey that day, correct? We did. And you spent a few hours with your son, and you spent a few hours with Corey, right? Correct. And your wife noticed that Corey had a bruise on his forehead, correct? He did. And did you see the bruise located on Corey's forehead? I did. During the course of this case, on April 2nd of 2021, after Corey passed, you spoke to Detective Mitchell with the prosecutor's office, right? I did. And you gave him a, a pretty long statement, correct? It was. And when you were speaking to the detective, nowhere did you tell him that Corey had this bruise when you saw him on the 22nd, correct? I don't believe I mentioned it. And with all of your training that you just talked about and being a police officer and in Homeland Security, this wasn't important for you to mention when you were talking to the detective, correct? I didn't think it was any more significant than him telling me he fell on the treadmill. Okay. So Corey told you that he fell on the treadmill? It was a joint discussion at dinner. Okay. And again, this wasn't important to you at that time? Well, it was important that he had a scrape on his forehead, oh. um, but I didn't think to mention it to Detective Mitchell. Okay. Now, although David Greger's testimony was brief, it gives us an opportunity to look ahead at the defense's case, and with us to discuss it is trial attorney Alexis Rosenberg and criminal defense attorney Bob Mata. Now, Bob, let me start with you, because people handle grief uh, differently, but the prosecution's going to imply that Greger was trying to flee after Corey's death, and in addition to this testimony, it was real that Greger had some uh, search history, like can red marks turn into bruises? Can your phone be tracked in airplane mode? Did the defendant's father do anything substantial for the defendant's case, or did he hurt it? I, I think I'm, I'm kind of ambivalent. I, I don't know that he really helped or hurt. Um, I, I think that ultimately, like you said, kind of the bigger focus seems to be by the state is Christopher's reactions to his son's death which, you know, anytime you have a case like this where we really don't know what happened, you know, I mean, we're really, everyone through the experts and the, the medical examiners, and ultimately, I'm assuming your husband will be coming to conclusions as to what really caused the death here, you know, so they have to rely on, on kind of the circumstantial evidence that exists, and they're always going to look at the behavior of a parent in particular with respect to how are they responding when they, they come to realize that their child has died. And I, and I think that they're weighing heavily on that and relying on that and hoping that the jury will find that it's, it's unusual. And, and to be honest with you, I have four kids. Like, I, I would be a puddle. You, you know, I, I don't know how I'd be responding. Uh, I don't know if I could be in the room. It's, like, easy to sit here and judge from the sidelines when you're not going through what this particular gentleman and defendant went through in that moment in time as to how you'd respond. So it always makes me nervous in cases like this when they're relying on that type of evidence so heavily. Yeah. Now, Alexis, Corey Machola's the cause of death is the crux of this case. And we know medical examiners will be crucial witnesses on both sides of the coin. Do you think Christopher Greger should join the defense case on that stand? <laughs> no, I do not think the defendant should get on the, the stand in this case. I mean, I have to disagree with Bob. I think the fact that his father says he's going to call the police um, and he takes off to another state, I think that's a problem. I think that's a huge that's a huge problem, even though he on he, as he sits there and what we're witnessing, he appears to be upset. The father's testifying he's upset. But also the key thing, the father, when he was asked whether he had seen the treadmill video, 
He said, no, I don't want to watch my, basically my grandson being harmed. So, I mean, that, that's very, very telling. Um, so, no, I do not think the defendant should take the stand in this case at all. Okay, so back to you, Bob. When you have defense witnesses being called in the midst of the state case, could that become confusing to the jury as to what the proofs are for each side? Absolutely, especially uh, when it comes to if it's going to be forensic evidence. And I know that the issue is I think that one of their witnesses is a forensic guy that can't testify until the 22nd. So they've they've allowed the defense to put some witnesses. I, I think it could be very, very confusing to the to the jury, especially uh, in light of the fact that it's it's going to be technical testimony um, in terms of because jurors just don't understand the system. You know, like I went through 20 years of practice and I came to realize very quickly that my clients rarely knew what was going on in court, which my defendants are the equivalent to the jurors. Lay people just do not understand how the system works. It's going to be left to the judge really to give uh, some clear instructions to the jurors mm -hmm. so that they understand exactly what's going on. But does that cure what's going on in their minds in terms of it being scrambled? I don't know. All right. We're going to have to see. And I want to thank both of you for weighing in. And we'll continue to monitor the latest developments in this most tragic case out of Ocean County, New Jersey.